everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And again, today we have a creature that does not seem to fit any of these categories because we are covering the oh so wonderful firefly. This, of course, is a very, very special listener episode dedicated to Audrey, who has been listening to the show since the very beginning, and I'm sure that many of you listening probably have that in common with Audrey. So thank you very much, Audrey, for your wonderful suggestion. I hope you enjoy your very own episode. And if you would like your very own episode and to learn about a creature that you find interesting, you can request an animal in three ways. You can send a message via Instagram to the handle RelaxWithAnimalFacts. You can go to RelaxWithAnimalFacts.com and click on the Animal Request tab. And you can always email RelaxWithAnimalFacts at gmail.com. I always get excited when I get new emails or messages from you guys, so please don't be shy. I'm sure you all have animal suggestions that the rest of us would love to learn about. Now, just before we hop right in, if you love Relax with Animal Facts and you would like more of it, the Patreon page Relax with Animal Facts is constantly being updated with exclusive episodes. Right now we are in the Extinct Animal mini-series, where so far we have covered the Megalodon, the Dodo, the Tasmanian Tiger, and the Woolly Mammoth. And so if you would like exclusive episodes, as well as to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash relax with animal facts, or just go to the little link in the show notes. And as we are starting the show, I'm just going to say where I got my facts from because this episode would not have been possible without these resources. All of these facts come from smithsonianmag.com, kids.nationalgeographic.com, firefly.org, blogs.scientificamerican.com, and etimonline.com. All of these resources will be in the show notes or the description of this episode. So if you would like to learn more about the Firefly and about a lot of other cool stuff, I encourage you to click on those links. And now we are going to start to slow down just a little bit. I would like for all of you to notice maybe where you are carrying some tension. You might notice it's in the legs or the hands or the head. I think the most common place is the shoulders, but everyone is different here. In my case today, it's in my hands as always. And where we will be going, we really don't need all of this tension. And so I encourage you to write alongside me, try to relax those parts of your body, because we are going into this immersive experience together into the forest where there are gently rolling streams where we can behold the beautiful light show put on by the firefly. What a gift it is that even in this lush green forest where we are away from all the noise, we have a chance to behold fireworks. Not the ones that explode and pop, but the ones that glitter and sparkle in their modest and natural beauty. And for this natural fireworks show, we have the Firefly to thank. The Firefly is a type of beetle, and the scientific name for this particular beetle is Lampyridae, a name derived from the Latin term Lampyris, which roughly translates to mean glowworm. There are more than 2,000 species of this glowing creature, but despite their name, only some species produce adults that glow. Not all 2,000 have this ability to put on this kind of display. In the western United States, for example, 
fireflies lack the ability to produce the light we are seeing now, but all of them, regardless if they glow or not, are going to prefer anywhere with some water. They love to hang out at streams, rivers, areas that are marshy, or even small ponds or indents in the soil that happen to be full of water. They love all of this. Most, but not all, lightning bugs, as they are also called, have wings. And despite the scientific name that goes back to a Latin term that describes glowworms, they are different from the glowworm, which also happens to be a light-producing insect. But both the firefly and the glowworm are known as luminescent. This is an adjective that is given to animals that have the ability to produce light naturally or organically. The mechanism of this luminescence is called bioluminescence. So that prefix bio has to do with life. So it is luminescence arising from strictly life or natural chemical processes. We will save this for just a little bit later. But of these 2,000 firefly species, most of them will live in humid regions of Asia and the Americas, where they will mostly enjoy feasting on pollen and nectar. But the larvae, which are the baby fireflies that haven't fully developed yet, meaning that they don't have their wings or anything else, they will opt to feed on worms, snails, and insects. They can't exactly fly to different plants, and so they will feast on whatever is close by. So why exactly are we able to behold this spectacle? Why is it that they give out light in the first place? As it turns out, it doesn't seem to be just for fun or to exercise a form of showmanship, but they mostly use this light to talk to one another. This light is used as a form of communication between fireflies and as a way to search and find a mate. And each firefly species of the 2000 that exist has its own unique flashing pattern. For one example, when a male firefly wishes to communicate with a female, he will fly near the ground while he flashes his light every six seconds. Once the male is closer to the ground, the female is going to have a bit of an easier time discerning whether or not he is from the same species that she is. This is because most, not all, but most female fireflies cannot fly. She will answer his flashes with her own light show, and then the male is able to find her. Now, embedded in this process is something that I think we would be quick to gloss over, but is profoundly interesting. The male firefly and the female firefly will speak to one another by these flashes through that mechanism of bioluminescence as we have just covered. But notice one thing. The male firefly will flash his lights as he is nearing the ground every six seconds. Researchers can say six seconds because they can time them doing it and they do it on a consistent basis. They have an instinctual sense of timing. They know when six seconds are over and that they need to again light themselves up. This suggests to me that a firefly could probably keep time in music better than I could. But in all seriousness, the firefly having this sense of timing is something not to just gloss over, but to chew on and reflect on and think about. That is pretty amazing. So while the male firefly is using his lights to woo a female, predators like toads and birds get a different message from the one the male is conveying to the female firefly. 
You would think that because they glow and are very visible and give away their position pretty frequently, that that would mean they would be a feast for predators nearby. But that is not the case. They will rarely try to eat fireflies because they will release some sort of very bad tasting and toxic blood. And this flashing pattern that for one is meant for something different to the predators is a kind of warning light saying stay away, almost like maybe a flashing yield sign is for us. And in today's fireworks show, we can see mostly yellow light flashing all around, but firefly light can be yellow or green or orange. So maybe the next time we see some fireflies, we could get different colors. So let us talk about this light more specifically. The light that they are producing is known as cold light. This means that these lights produced by the firefly are among some of the most efficient lights in the world. 100% of their energy is emitted as light. Maybe you have learned something about incandescent bulbs in comparison to other sorts like fluorescent for example. The incandescent bulb emits 10% of its energy as light and the rest of that 90% is not released as light, but rather as heat. It is why when you turn on, say, an incandescent light bulb and leave it on for about 10 minutes, touching it is not a great idea. They can be very, very hot. If we compare that with a fluorescent light bulb, they emit about 90% of their energy as light. So much more of that energy is being used as light, but it still has 10% being released as heat. And so because 100% of the energy is emitted as light in the firefly, there is no heat being produced. Hence why scientists refer to firefly lights as cold lights. So let's talk about exactly how that happens. In the tail of a firefly, you will find two chemicals that are organically made in their body, luciferase and luciferin. Luciferin is a very heat-resistant chemical that glows under certain conditions. And luciferase, which is an enzyme, the way you know it is an enzyme is by that suffix ASE, A's, just how we have, for example, lactase for lactose, we have luciferase for luciferin, and this enzyme is going to trigger the light emission. ATP, the chemical that is within the firefly's body and in our body as well, for those of you that are very sciencey, it stands for adenosine triphosphate. It is basically a building block to energy. So the ATP in the firefly's body is going to convert to energy and initiate the glow. So not just us, not just fireflies have ATP, but all living things. We might have heard that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, but ATP is sort of like the fuel. And not only will the adult male fireflies glow, their eggs will glow as well, albeit only in some species. So in some of the species among the 2000, the larvae and even the eggs emit light. Their eggs have been observed to flash in response to certain stimuli, like gentle tapping or vibrations. And when the firefly is out of the egg, they will grow into adulthood, but live only long enough to be able to mate and lay eggs. So as they are an adult, they may not even need to eat during that entire process. They will only be adults for about three to four weeks before they die. 
they will spend much more time in the larva stage than in the adult stage. The adult stage being about less than a month, while they will be larva for one to two years, depending on the species and on the circumstances. There are four main phases of the firefly's life, beginning, of course, with the egg for about three weeks. They will then hatch from their eggs to become larva for one to two years. And before becoming an adult, they will undergo a stage known as the pupa stage. That is a stage that is not limited to the firefly, but to many other insects. But this pupa stage for the firefly will be about three weeks before they become an adult. So we can see here that while the larva stage is one to two years, all of the other stages combined, egg, pupa, and adult, will add up to only about two and a half months maximum. So their lives are short, but very busy and amazing. And these fireflies will live out their lives on pretty much every continent except Antarctica. Some species of firefly larvae are generally aquatic. Some of them even have gills, while others will live almost entirely in the trees. So some are aquatic and some seem to be arboreal. There are even fireflies that survive in the winter. One North American species is active in the wintertime, and adults of these winter fireflies won't emit light, but instead hide in the bark of trees, which is probably why that is a more unknown fact. There is even a firefly that can grow to be about the size of your palm. Females of the Lamprigera firefly are huge in comparison to the other ones that we see on a more regular basis. This firefly can be seen in places like Thailand, for example, and these females will be much larger than the male counterparts, but also lack wings. So these gargantuan Lamprigera fireflies will emit a good amount of light because of how big they are. The females of one kind of firefly, known as Photuris, have earned the nickname Femme Fatales. We learned earlier that most fireflies, when they are adults, won't even eat, but these ones do. So they will mimic the flash patterns of other firefly species. As we learned, each one can have their own distinct pattern. We'll mimic this and lure unsuspecting males in closer to them, which will then become her dinner. They will also then take the toxins of the male that prevents many of the toads and birds from eating them, and deposit this chemical into their eggs as a sort of defense from predators. Some of these female fireflies will even sneak onto spider webs in order to steal the prey that is stuck on the web and eat it for themselves. As to how they are able to even identify the prey that is stuck in the web and also emerge from the web unstuck themselves is unknown. How they are able to do this remains unanswered. But this specific interaction of the firefly stealing the food away from the spider is known as kleptoparasitism, which is a very long word. I am convinced that many researchers, as well as other groups of study, say like historians, they will make up words to ensure we will always need them to define them. It is a great way to cultivate job security because they make up these huge terms and then we need them to define what it even means. But anyways, let us move on to the name of the firefly. What does the name mean or where does it come from? So the term firefly as we use it was first coined somewhere in the 1650s 
and bore the definition, an insect which has the faculty of becoming luminous. And it comes from both the term fire and the term fly. Ancient Greek has kaisolampus, which means firefly, or a beetle with a tail that lights up at night, which comes from the word kaisos and kaithos, which mean rear end, and lampine, which means to shine. So we can see how rear end and to shine would be a very good description for a firefly, because that is exactly what they do. What an amazing creature. Now we are going to move on to the review portion of the show in which I read a review from one special listener out there. And today, DDG183 is writing all the way from the United States of America and writes, Hi, my name is Beckett. I love this podcast. There are many O's in there, so I had to do Beckett justice by pronouncing all of them. But Beckett continues, I love this podcast. It's my top favorite one. I'm 10 years old and I listen to it every night and it helps me sleep. And could you do an episode on the mole if you didn't do it? Or maybe the iguana? So yeah, great podcast. I love it. Thank you, Beckett, for your very kind review. I am so happy that you love this podcast, and I am so glad that you are a very special part of it. In terms of the animal suggestions, I don't believe we have done either the mole or the iguana. So those are both very good suggestions, and I will be sure to give you, Beckett, a special shout out on your future episode. If you want to leave a review like Beckett did because the show has helped you in any way, that is one of the biggest ways that you can give back and help more people find the show to explore in the woods and in the mountains right alongside us. Again, if you would love to learn about a certain animal that you find interesting and you would like your own podcast episode, feel free to submit your animal suggestion through Relax With Animal Facts on Instagram or by going to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and going to the Animal Request tab. Or you can always email relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. But I see that Beckett and many of you have left your animal suggestions in your review, which is also a legitimate way of doing it if you choose to do so. So I look forward to receiving all of your animal requests and learning about what animal you find interesting. If you want more of the Relax with Animal Facts podcast and would like to explore the islands of Mauritia, or the waters where the megalodon shark used to reside, you can go to the Patreon page Relax With Animal Facts. All of the relevant links are in the show notes or the description, so I look forward to seeing you there. All of the tiers give you access to all of the content, because I wanted to make sure as many of you could have access to this as possible. Thank you all for joining me in this lush green forest and walking by the stream to look at this wonderful firework show. Who would have known the firefly had so many cool secrets behind those whimsical lights? I hope you have all enjoyed this episode and that you will join me on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.